So, good morning class. This is our first lesson on understanding culture, society, and politics. And our topic for today is society as an objective reality. So, at the end of the lesson, we will, uh, the students, you are expected to at least explain how society and its institutions shape individuals and you demonstrate curiosity about the basic social institutions and be able to explain their respective roles in socialization. Now these are our guide questions that you would like to ponder after this topic. One, how does a society maintain order so that it will persist for a long period of time? Second, what are the roles of social institutions in reproducing social life? And lastly, why do scientists argue that society is an objective fact, so we generics? So without further ado, let's start our discussion. Now, you would want to uh, to revisit the term society. What does the word society mean? Actually, the, the word society, the English term society, came from the Latin word societas, which was derived and used as a noun, socius, which is actually used to describe a bond or interaction between parties that are either civil or friendly at least. Now, according to a Greek philosopher, we, we studied it already, that according to Greek philosopher Aristotle, human beings are by nature political animals or zoon politikon because nature, according to Aristotle, which does nothing in vain, has equipped them with speech and which enables them to communicate moral concepts such as justice, which are formative of the household and the city-state. Now, this was derived from the book he wrote entitled Politics. So, to summarize it, for Aristotle, we are by nature political animals and that we are creatures whose nature is to live in a society because we are capable of communicating concepts like justice, which are useful and in a way we can utilize these concepts in the formation of our society or in a community where we live in. Now, according to John Holmwood, the term society is used to describe a level of organization of groups that is relatively self-contained. Now, however, the boundedness of groups is always relative, and so sociologists may refer to human society, where the reference is to the interdependencies among all social groups or to subgroups such as family society, where the reference is to the typical interactions among the individuals making up a group of close kin. Now, in this definition, society may also refer to the persistent interactions among members of a particular group, like kinship group or other institution. Now, ordinarily, ordinarily, uh, when sociologists talk about society, they usually refer to the bounded territory of, or the concept of uh, what we call the nation state. Now, in political science, we also studied that. Now, uh, for example, like Philippine society, uh, the, chi the chi China, Malaysia, when we talk about society, we talk about, we also refer to the nation state as well. Although these uh, two concepts are not uh, completely synonymous. Now, today, however, with the advent of uh, globalization, 
Now, sociologists uh, tend to question uh, the fundamental importance given to a society as a unit of analysis because we have seen uh, that globalization tends to integrate societies in a world system that weakens the territorial boundaries of societies. So we have seen how, in a way, with the advent of technology and the, uh, the advancement of the use of social media and the increasing interrelatedness of uh, things through globalization, we, we gradually see now the, uh, the, uh, the diminish, in a way, uh, territorial boundaries of society, like the traditional notion of the nation state. Now, a common opinion among ordinary people is the belief that society does not uh, exist except for individuals who compose it. Now, in the early 19th century, uh, when sociology uh, uh, as a science was still in its infancy, it's still developing as a, a distinct discipline apart from social philosophy. Now, many uh, sociologists describe uh, this uh, kind of worldview. We call this a methodological individualism. Now, this view states that a collective concepts such as groups, associations, and societies do not exist, but only individual members. Now, this view actually states that collective uh, concepts such as uh, groups, associations, and societies do not actually exist, but only individual members. Uh, for example, of this uh, a typical class, uh, a typical uh, class in a school. So, which means using methodological individualism, it says that the class does not actually exist, but rather, uh, but only the teachers and the students. Rather, what exists uh, is the teacher and the students, but not actually the class. Rather, it is in a way uh, a, a mere concept, not as as a, not as an objective reality in, in a way. For example, army, uh, the term army is from the point of view of methodological individualism. It is not a real entity, but rather it is just a concept which is composed of uh, soldiers uh, forming it that uh, enable the term uh, army to be meaningful in a way. Now, Emil Durkheim, uh, the founding father of uh, French sociology, argued strongly against this. So, uh, he calls this a theory of uh, what we call the, uh, the social sociological uh, realism. And it states that, according to Durkheim, that a society is actually a reality. Reality sui generis a very uh, unique reality and cannot be reduced into individual aggregates or parts. This is against uh, the individual uh, or the methodological individualism. Now, uh, let us uh, take, for example, uh, language. Now, according to him, uh, one cannot really invent language out of nowhere because language, therefore, exists relatively independent of the consciousness and use of the individual speaker because one has to use uh, the language system that is already in use in a particular society when the individual is uh, born. Therefore, language exists relatively okay, independent of the consciousness and use of the individual speaker. So, in addition, Durkheim sought to prove the existence of society by demonstrating the external constraints that society imposes uh, upon its members. So, one, for example, one cannot actually deny the existence of a banking system. Okay. Here. Uh, one cannot deny the existence of the banking system. But one cannot go to a bank 
and deposits scratch papers without experiencing formal sanctions. Now, uh, Emile Durkheim's argument on the existence of uh, society is demonstrated further in his classical work entitled uh, Suicide. Now, Durkheim showed that the external constraints of society work through control mechanism that either prevented people from committing suicide or made them prone to suicide. Now, in this book, Durkheim actually uh, avoided the use of a psychological and individualistic explanation uh, for the study of uh, suicide. Rather, he looked into the statistics of suicide rates and provided a sociological explanation for the persistence of uh, suicide. Now, Durkheim showed that uh, that uh, the external constraints of society work uh, actually through control mechanism. So it is a, uh, if a group, okay, if a group or a society has a very strong solidarity or sense of belongingness, then uh, Durkheim claimed that the individual is most likely to attach herself or himself to a society. So, the tendency of the individual to move away from the group is lessened when there is a strong social bond. And uh, Durkheim, according to him, strong regulation of the individuals in a society or a group ensures that, he termed it, ensures that members uh, properly follow okay, the norms and prescribe uh, moral behavior. And actually, uh, we have a term in uh, the, the, the Greek term, anomi, from the, the root word nomos and a, uh, which, means, which means without, so without law. So anomi is a, is, a, is a situation wherein a society lacks social regulation through social norms. Now, what is ironic here is that aside from the lack of regulation, excessive regulation also, in a way, uh, contributes to the uh, to the uh, to the rate of uh, or suicidal rate in a particular society, according to Emil Durkheim. Now, if there is a very what a very stringent or a very rigid regulation, then a society might in a way impose uh, upon its uh, members or individuals to, in a way, commit suicide. For example, here is a, uh, uh, the, the kamikaze pilots uh, during the World War II, where in a uh, Uh, because of that excessive regulation of, uh, for example, of uh, you have to die for the country. So the kamikaze pilots would, instead of crashing their, their planes out of nowhere, then they would uh, directly uh, target using their planes, okay? Uh, enemies, for example, ships during the, uh, during the war in the Pacific. We have seen that uh, the the uh, the opening salvo of the Japanese uh, Imperial Army in the Pearl Harbor, and we have seen that in uh, in our country. And did you know that in our city, Mabalakat City, this is the place where the first kamikaze pilot okay took their flight. So, kung makikita niyo yung lugar dun sa may bandang S C Tex Dolores Exit. There is this uh, shrine, the Kamikaze Shrine. That is where the first, okay, Kamikaze pilots in the Philippines, okay, took their flight and sacrificed their lives. Now, uh, Durkheim argues that uh, our actions are constrained by the norms and sanctions imposed by society. And these norms are internalized through collective uh, 
conscience. So what do we mean by collective conscience here? Now, collective conscience is the totality of beliefs and sentiments common to the average members of a society that forms a determined system with a life of its own. Now, we can see uh, the only argument here is that uh, a society is, uh, in a way, if, if you remember, okay, that uh, in our discussion of the dominant approaches and theories in the social sciences, we encountered the idea of superstructures in Marxism, okay, in, in, in instu institutionalism, the structures that govern and guide our behavior, that determine and in a way inform our behavior. So in a way, Emil Durkheim is also pressing the same thing, where in a society, is actually informing or or puts pressure or constraints on the on the uh on the behavior of uh, the individuals in, or the members of the society in such a way that individuals are in a way influenced on how to behave and on how to act and therefore in behaving as such and upon the the, the, the constraints imposed by the society, there is what we call uh, a collective conscience on which people participate uniformly. For example, uh, when we talk about norms, right, we talk about this in, a, in a sociology, uh, there are things that are not really recorded, but we follow them. Because they are ingrained in us. For example, pagmamana. Okay? There is no actually law that, uh, what, uh, there is no actually law that, uh, in a way, forces us to, to do pagmamano. But because it is, uh, in a way, a part of collective conscience as a Filipino, then we do it. We exercise pagmamano. Now, the contemporary sociologist Peter Berger, according to him, supported that kind of view that the objectivity of society extends to all its constituent elements. Now, institutions, roles, and identities actually exist as objectively real phenomena in the social world. Though they and this world are at the same time nothing but human productions. Now, for example, the family as the institutionalization of human sexuality. Okay? In particular, society is experienced and apprehended as an objective reality. Now, the institution is there. The family as an institution is there. External and coercive that is imposing its predefined patterns upon the individual in this particular area of his life. Now, what is being pointed here is that, for example, the institutionalization of family is imposing some constraints and patterns on, on trying to guide and inform on how people in that particular society should move or act. For example, what is the social role of a parent from the point of view of family as institution? What is the social role of the children? The kuya, the panganay, the bunso. What is the social role of a father, a husband, a mother, or a wife? And this institution is actually external and coercive because it imposes to us it's predefined patterns upon the individual, okay, on how that individual should act in a particular aspect or area of his life. That's why we have a notion of, ah, uh, anong, anong, anong klaseng ama yan, hindi magbuting ama. How do we know? And so this is what, the, the, as part of the collective conscience as, 
explained by Emil Durkheim and the example of Peter Berger as the institutionalization, instit institutionalization of the family, that these concepts, institutions, are actually a, a special kind of a social reality, but they are still part of human constructs or uh, a mere uh, uh, products of the human. Now, uh, Peter Berger's uh, remarks could be uh, extended to all other social institutions. And before we deal with the coercive uh, characteristics of the various social institutions, now it is uh, important that we first discuss the process of social reproduction. So in, in the next lesson, we will be discussing the concept social reproduction, how societies persist. How come there are societies that up to this time, they are existing? How come there are societies or there were societies that existed before, but now they no longer exist? So we will uh, be discussing the concept of Louis Althusser, a French uh, Social, uh, fr French philosopher and sociologist, and we will also be uh, discussing the concept of uh, the the social reproduction theory of uh, Talcott, Pars uh, Talcott Parsons, okay, American sociologist, and uh, we will be discussing the uh, the strength of this theory, and uh, using their concepts, we'll be discussing how how uh, how are they able to explain why do societies persist and why do they exist in a very long period of time and we will be discussing as well their weaknesses okay this a v on the concept of human agency and on the failure to in a way uh recreate uh in a way uh, recreate situations as a uh as uh, exemplified by the statement of Karl Marx in uh in his uh, very uh, a very controversial uh, book written uh, or uh, the the title would be the 18th Romare of Louis Bonaparte. So that's it. If you have questions, kindly. Uh, kindly pose your questions and I will review them and I will uh, answer, try to address them as soon as possible. Good day.